thank you everyone for coming to the session. I'm really proud to be a part of the 101 track. And a little bit about myself, I'm originally from Eastern Europe, so my native language is Russian. And coming to the United States, definitely I had to learn English. And what is interesting, uh, the transition for me from being a Java developer to being a Golang developer was pretty similar. So I had to learn different language, I had to understand the concepts, and it was a pretty fun journey. And I would like to know a little bit more about you, like how many of you use Kubernetes in any way as a user, as a developer? All right, great. How many of you write tools for Kubernetes? All right. How many of you use Go? Oh, I really like the diversity. All right, so this session is gonna be about using Kubernetes API from Go. First, let's talk about why we all love Kubernetes. As a user, you probably appreciate the feature set. There's so many things that you can use uh, from Kubernetes for the workloads, for the node management. And if you're a big company, uh, you appreciate the, uh, the Kubernetes ability to handle the big workloads and its performance. And if you're a Kubernetes contributor, you definitely appreciate the community, which is very friendly, very approachable, very helpful. But the one thing that I wanted to focus on is Kubernetes extensibility. So that was actually uh, very useful from the developer standpoint. You can extend Kubernetes in so many ways. You can develop your own APIs if it suits your use case. You can use custom resource definitions. We're gonna talk more about it on the next slide. And that extensibility, that what actually makes Kubernetes a platform. So what platform means that is there's a core feature set and this pretty much set and uh, it can be extended by the third parties without actually disrupting the main code base. So you don't have to, if you need something extra, you don't have to go and modify the Kubernetes repo. You can write it and push it to your own repo. You can deploy it and use it. Um, even the APIs can be plugged. And this new APIs that you plug in can be used from the kube control. And then you can write your own custom controllers if you want to control your own resources. And that's what makes the Kubernetes ecosystem. All the tools on the slide, I was too lazy to put them all, but there's like a bunch of them. They're, they would extend Kubernetes. Those are the, basically the custom controllers. So they extend the login functionality, they provide you the DNS, the service mesh, um, the uh, monitoring, and that is pretty cool. And uh, if you think about the ways that you would like to contribute to Kubernetes, or you would like to extend existing Kubernetes functionality, you would like to make a better logging, then you, you have to become a part of the ecosystem. Um, and there are several ways to extend Kubernetes. Like on this slide, I've listed all the main Kubernetes components, uh, which are like uh, the controller, uh, the API server, uh, the scheduler, and then on the worker, there's a kubelet and there's a kube proxy. And if you look at the kubelet, there's a way to extend the container runtime interface, which is, sounds pretty intimidating to me, like too complicated. I've never looked into it, but there is a way to do it. So you can do Docker, you can use Rocket. Then on the controller manager side, there is a cloud provider. So you know that Kubernetes supports multiple cloud providers like a, um, Google Cloud Provider, Amazon, and those that all, uh, these components are all pluggable. And there is a big initiative in the Kubernetes, like the, some of them are part of the Kubernetes core base, but they're working on moving it out. So it's gonna be more flexible. Like if you're a digital ocean, for example, you can develop your own plugin and you don't have to contribute it to the Kubernetes core. You can just keep it in your own repo and, and handle the deployment. And then if you look at the API server, that's where it becomes more interesting and more user and developer friendly. You can build your own API extension. So Kubernetes native API, they have a bunch of objects like nodes, pods. You can design your own objects. Like for example, if you do monitoring, you can think about your custom object that you can use just for monitoring purposes. And then you can write custom controllers for these resources. That's what came to the left of the slide, and that's what we are gonna be focusing on today, writing the custom controllers. That component that just talks to the API, it can monitor either existing Kubernetes 
a resource, it can monitor your custom resource, then it can act on it, modify it, do a bunch of stuff. And you'll hear a term controller a lot. And there is no exact definition for it. If you Google what is Kubernetes controller, you're gonna be given like a bunch of stuff. And then I try to think about it, like what would be the best way to, just, to, to explain it? So have any one of you used Kubernetes ingress? So yeah, yeah. So Kubernetes ingress is just a way to provide the entry point for your application and to balance it. But if you look closer, the ingress, Kubernetes ingress resource is just a shell. It doesn't have any implementation. So you create Kubernetes ingress resource and then there is some magic happens. And what this magic is, the people deploy the ingress controllers, which is a separate piece of code that runs, monitors Kubernetes ingress resource, and configures the external load balancer or internal load balancer uh, to provide the actual functionality. And then it modifies ingress resource with a load balancer IP address. So as a user, you create your ingress and then you magically get the IP address back. That's what ingress controller does. That's what controller is. It monitors something, it does something, and then it updates the resource and gives, gives it back to the user. So now, how does the control, what are the ways to talk to the Kubernetes API? The most simple and the most user-friendly way is of course the UI, the dashboard. Then kubectl is also very user-friendly. If you prefer CLI, that's a great tool. And then there's the programmatic access. So if you're gonna write your tool in any language, Go, whatever, you'd probably call these APIs programmatically. You're not gonna be calling the kube control. Although it's like kube control has a bunch of commands that I actually appreciate a lot, like kubectl apply, it's great. So yeah, programmatic access using APIs. But then how do you call these APIs? So Kubernetes API server is just a HTTP server that accepts a request, lists the resources, get the resource, update, remove. But how do you call them? Like, is it just a raw HTTP request? No. So, well, you can send it as a raw HTTP request, but there are like a bunch of libraries out there that are developed for different languages, for Python, Java, Go, and as any language you can think of. But those three are like the most popular one. And today we are gonna focus on the top one, client, client.go. So that's a great library, I've been using it a lot. Um, I work for the company that does a lot of stuff for uh, Kubernetes, around Kubernetes. We use client.go a lot. We monitor Kubernetes clusters. And yeah, so I've been using this tool for a while. Why would I recommend to use the Go client as opposed to any other language? So Kubernetes is written in Go. And I always find it's, it's better to develop the client in the language in which the main component is written. Because like, it implies the faster update. If the, if the main component gets updated, like Kubernetes gets updated, client.go gets updates almost immediately. I'm not saying that the other tools don't get the immediate updates, but the client.go is probably the fastest one. Go is pretty simple, it's easy to use, and it's very easy to be used for in applications that are meant to be deployed in the container. And that's something that we are gonna do today. So, the best way to learn something is actually to build something from scratch. So today, we're gonna build a tool that is gonna monitor Kubernetes nodes, and it's gonna alert when the storage occupied by the images changes. So here's the link to the to the repo where the tool resides. It's a pretty simple tool, but we're gonna go from the very beginning to the very end. We're gonna do it like everything. So, I, as a developer, I like to sneak a peek of what people use for the development, what makes their life easier. So here are some tools that I use for demo project. Those are all internal tools, open source. We just use them, uh, you just use them in Rancher to make the developer life easier. So the Go scale, if you're not familiar with Go and you wonder what should be my Go project structure, you can just run this tool and it will create the basic structure for you. It will even create you the main class that you can actually invoke and run without any compiler. Then the trash, so it, it's a tool that uh, manages the uh, third party dependencies. Usually managing third party dependencies can be very, very painful. And there are many tools out there, but I like this one just because it's very simple. 
I'll show you how I use it. And then there's a tool called Dapper. So if, if you have an application that is meant to run in the container, then you would probably like to build an image for it. I, I use Mac, but if I run the container, it can be Ubuntu. So I need to find some simple way to actually build my application so it can run on Ubuntu. So I use Dapper tool for that. It will, it will spawn the container with, from the Ubuntu image, it will build your program in it, and it will give you back a nice Docker image. So what would be the first step? The first step would be to add client.go dependency. So you have to make sure that, it, this, that uh, the dependency is compatible with whatever Kubernetes version you're using. So I'm currently using the, and for this demo, I'm using the, uh, I think it's 4.0. So it works pretty well with Kubernetes 1.7 and 1.8, but I think there is a newer version of client.go. It, it shouldn't be any different. So what you do, you just add this to the file, vendor.conf, and then you just run the trash command, the tool that I've shared earlier. What it's gonna do, it's gonna pull all the third party dependencies to your project, and that's it, like the job is done. The tool is pretty smooth, I haven't had any problems with that. Then, the second step, so you define the vendor, you got all the third party dependencies that you need. By the way, it's gonna, it's gonna if, if, if this client.go uses some other dependencies, transitive dependencies, it's gonna pull it in as well. You don't have to define them in this file. So Trash will do all the job for you to figuring out what needs to be pulled extra, and, it, and that's it. Now, the second way, if you look at the client.go doc, the first thing you're gonna, you're gonna see is like how you wanna run it. Do you wanna run your tool in cluster or do you wanna run your tool outside of the cluster? And it's like, I don't know, what are the advantages of what approaches? So what, it, what does it mean to run in cluster? It means that your application is gonna run as a part of the, con inside the container that is gonna be deployed as a part in Kubernetes. What advantages it gives you? Kubernetes is gonna manage your application. You can configure health check. If your application dies, Kubernetes is gonna bring it back. If you wanna run it on every node, you can, you can deploy it as a daemon set. Then, why would you choose to run application outside of the cluster? One of the use cases I'm working on, I'm, one of my tools uh, actually monitors multiple Kubernetes clusters, so it has to be deployed outside. So I deploy the outside, I run it as a binary, I monitor it myself. Then another way, like another good use case for that is like, let's say you develop something and you really like, you want to test things fast, you don't want to build the image every time you make a change. So you just run it as a binary, you just build, run it as a binary, and then at the end you can choose, all right, at the end my application is perfect, I'm gonna deploy it in cluster, I'm gonna use the first approach. For testing, I'm gonna use the second approach. All right, demo time. I'm switching to my ID. I'm using Visual Studio Code for Go development. Is the is the size all, all good? Should I make it bigger? It's great. And before we move on to the IDE fun part, any questions about the previous slides? No? All right, all right, let's move on. Let's start from the top. So in Go, here are all the imports. It's all the third party packages that I'm using in my tool. And this one is my favorite one. That's a CLI. So my application is gonna accept the config parameter, which is gonna be the path to the kubeconfig file so my tool can run outside of the cluster. So if you've got a kube control, the kubeconfig is probably all gonna be already there. So just specify the path to it when you, when, it, when, when you run it. Then, once you get this config, it's time to get the client. Oh, sorry, why am I switching back? Here we go. So this is, this is the part where you actually decide on how you wanna, how you wanna run your application. Do you want it, uh, to run it outside of the cluster? If the path to config is not empty, then you use this package to build the config from the content of the file from this path. Or if the path is empty, then you run it in cluster. So what are, this, like, what are the internals? So usually people use service account for authentication in the pod. What it means is that the default service account, if you don't specify anything, is gonna be assigned to the pod. 
and it means that the credentials are going to be saved somewhere in the pod. And this tool, it will know where to look for them to initiate the in-cluster config. Once the config is created, that's where you call Kubernetes, which is a client.go package, to create a new client for the config. So we've got the client, and this client will help to make the request to the Kubernetes API server. Now, before you actually start implementing something, when I work with a new package, I just test basic functions. And one of the basic functions for the HTTP server is CRUD, basic CRUD, create, remove, uh, create, read, update, and delete. So let's move to this. So the first basic function, we know that for our application, we need to monitor the nodes. So we need to get the list of the nodes somehow. For that, I'm going to call client set, which we just created. And then I'm going to call core Kubernetes APIs, because I know that my nodes are the part of the core Kubernetes APIs. And then I'm going to say, OK, so I need the nodes object. And then comes the operation that you, that you are calling for this node function. I want to list them. And the, uh, you can pass the list option parameters. Like, for example, you want to filter the nodes that you want to check. Like in my case, I'm running Minikube, which is pretty simple to install. And I know that the node name for the Minikube is always Minikube. So I'm just saying, OK, give me the Minikube node. And what it can give you back, it can give you either the nodes or it can give you the error. So error, something, something went wrong. I'm just going to skip. If my nodes are fine, I got them. I can iterate through them, but I just choose, all right, I'm just going to get the first of them. And then what you can do with the object that you get, you can update it. So that's the second operation that I demo here. So basically, you, you can set any field. You can reset any field on the object. And then you call client set very similar to the list. You can just, instead of list, you call update, and you pass the reference to the node. And here's some commented code which demonstrates removal. I didn't want to remove the Minikube node, so I commented it out. But it's pretty similar. Like You also call the client set core APIs. You call the delete. And then you can pass the delete options, which is pretty cool. Like You can say, all right, so what is grace period? I'm passing the grace period. It means uh, delete my object, but delete it only after 10 seconds. So OK, so now we've got the client. We know how to do the basic CRUDs. Now it's time to think about it's like how are we going to implement our node polling? So, yeah, and that I usually start simple. I don't think about like complicated uh, way of doing things. So I start with polling. Like the basic way to do it is to poll something. By polling something means that you list something and then you wait for a certain period of time and then you list again and you continue doing it over and over again. But there is certainly downsides to this approach. It's like you only need to get the information when something gets changed. Like, we are interested in the changes in the images storage. Um, and what I would like to have ideally, I would, like to, I would like to get the notification when something gets changed for the node. So I want to watch for the changes, and I want to be notified. And on this notification, I'll decide of what I'm going to do. So that's where the informers come. And now, what is the informer? Informer, it's a very nice way of watching for the resource and actually passing the callback function, which can be called when the resource is modified. So here is an example. Here we are calling the cache package, which is a part of the client.go. Here we go. And then we say, OK, give me the informer. And what we are passing to the informer, we are passing several things. So first of all, we are passing on the instructions of how we want our resource to be listed and how we want our resource to be watched. So we are passing the list watch function. So we want to get the nodes. And well, nodes and node is not namespace. So we just say namespace all. And we want to get all the fields. So we are passing the watch list. And then we are passing the object that we want to get. So we want to get the API node. And then we are passing our callback functions. And we are passing the callback functions for, to handle the add and the remove. We don't uh, so add and update. We don't care about the remove, because we know what, once the node is gone, we no longer care about the image storage capacity. 
So I'm just saying, okay, call these functions whenever the node gets added and whenever get, the node gets updated. And there's one more parameter that you can pass in, which is a resync period. So what is a resync period? Sometimes like, well, there are no perfect things in the world and uh, sometimes the list or watch can break. It would be nice to have some backup mechanism which will be called periodically. Like what I'm saying here, like every 30 seconds, even if nothing happens to the nodes, please give me them back so I can, I can do something. So even though, even when the watch function fails by some reason, I'm still backed up by this periodic polling. So I just, I made it a bit extreme, like 30 seconds, you can do it five minutes or anything you like. Then, so you're passing all these parameters, what are you getting back? So you're getting, you're getting back the controller that you have, to, that, that is gonna actually do the watches and you're getting back something else very nice, the store, what is store, this is cache. So you're getting back the cache which will be uh, for sure updated to the latest objects. So your tool, if, need, if it's needed, you don't have to call the Kubernetes APIs directly. You can just retrieve the objects from the cache and that will actually uh, reduce the memory footprint. So once you get this controller back, you have to start it to make it watch for something and then you're gonna be notified on the changes happening to your nodes. Now, there is an informer and there is something called shared informer. So what is the difference? What is in, where do you use one and where do you use another? So you, you can see that in the informer, you, you can define one function per, per every operation. Like you define one callback per add, one callback for update, and you get the cache back and the controller. Shared informer allows you to actually add more than one callback for the function and it gives you back the shared cache as well. So let's say you have, your application consists of multiple parts and there are multiple, um, there are mul actually here I, I, as an example, I give just the same function, but it's usually the different function, like different callback. So different callback are interested in the node information and ideally they would like to share the same cache, so to reduce the memory footprint. That's where I would use the shared informer. All right, and that before we move on, I wanted to share the way of accessing the cache that we got back from the informer. So here is an example. As our cache stores the node objects, there is a way to retrieve it by the name, which is gonna be the cache key. And you get back, and you get back the node. And you can do whatever you like with that. So what we did, we created the config, we created the client, we decided on the most optimal way of how to actually watch for the node changes. And well, now it is time to actually run the application. So here's my Go project, it's called KubeCon. And the first command I'm gonna do, I'm gonna run Go build just to make sure it compiles. All right, it works. And just to share the, 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 the structure of the directory, it has some, uh, so this is just one class, main.go. This is a binary that I've just created. And this is a vendor folder that we previously populated with trash. So we can look at it. What is this directory structure? What is this third party folder structure? It has a bunch of stuff on it. And if you look at the kubernetes.io, that's where our client.go is. All right, so we've built it now, we run it. How do we run it? Here we go. So you run as a kubecon and then you're passing the config to your, to your cube config, and then it starts doing its job. But no changes yet. So the, first, the very first change that you, that you see, you see, okay, something got changed for my node, but it's only because it's reading it for the very first time from the cache. Once it's read, there are no changes. So we have to trigger the changes somehow. I want to, I want to input to be changed. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to deploy something using the image that is not on the, on the Minikube node yet, just to increase the size occupied by the images. So I have this. All right, so it's just a simple deployment. It's going to deploy Ubuntu 1804.
All right, and now we're gonna watch and if there are changes happening. Please, please, <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's check on our pod. All right, so anyone, give me the, any image, like any of your favorite images that I can pull and use. Don't say Nginx because it already has Nginx. <laughs> Busy box. Busy box, all right. I don't think it matters. I'm just gonna remove this deployment because I wanna use the same name. All right. Ah, yeah. You see this line? Yeah, I'm so happy. <laughs> yeah, the tool works. Okay, but that's an example of how to run it outside the cluster. So you run it as a binary. Now it is time to deploy it as a Kubernetes application. And that's gonna be fun. All right, so what do we start with? We start with the Docker file. So here's the Docker file that I use. So the base is gonna be Ubuntu, and that's the command that is gonna call, which is my binary, basically. And now, how am I gonna build this image? I'm gonna build it using that tool that I've shared earlier called Dapper, and here's the way of how I'm gonna call it. So I'm gonna say, okay, my repo, my Docker Hub repo is gonna be Alina1108, my tag, all right, let's make it today's date. I always change the minor version because like my code is never that good to change the major version. So v070, and then I'm gonna call Dapper. So what it does, it creates a Docker container from Ubuntu. It builds the application in this Ubuntu container because if I build it on Mac and then I try to run it on Ubuntu, it's gonna complain. <laughs> so I have to build it in Ubuntu. I don't, I, and I don't wanna create like a virtual machine or something, so I build it inside the container. It's usually fast. Move on. Okay, so let me just share, like, let me kill something. This is right. This is a different Docker file. Yeah, that's what Dapper does. It creates a container, it builds the application, and then it gives you back the image. Where does the image get stored? Uh, the image gets stored in my, it doesn't push, it doesn't push to, the, uh, to the Docker Hub uh, automatically, so you have to do it manually. But where do you push from, from the container that it stores images? Uh, What's the output? From the output is like it just gives the image. So here you see, it built the image kubecon v070, so, and it's on my machine. So now I have to push it to the Docker Hub. Oh, okay, so it's not running it inside of Kubernetes. It's no, no, it's on my machine. All right, so I build this image, and I'm gonna push it. And now, to deploy it on, the, on Kubernetes, we have to define the YAML file again. Let me, let me remove the... Uh, all right, so I'm, I'm removing the old stuff. Let's look at the YAML definition for the, for the tool. So it's simple, it's just, okay, so we just have to change the image to the one that we've just built, and that's the name, the KubeCon demo, image pool policy always. Okay, I think I've typed it. Okay, let's see what happens. Something tells me that Okay, so one is terminating, that's the one that we just killed, and this one is container creating, that's the one that is a new one, that's probably still pulling the image. Oh. Okay, so this is the one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at the logs for this container. Ah, oh, it doesn't like something. Let's look at what it doesn't like. 
So looks like some permissions are set, which is a RBAC. I have RBAC in, enabled in my mini cube. So it means that by default, nobody can just run their tools and execute any random API calls. I have to grant the permissions to the tool to actually do something. So let's kill this bad guy. And let's define the permissions. All right, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna create a cluster row, which is gonna allow to operate on the nodes object, and it's gonna allow to get, watch, list, and update. So all the calls that we use in the tool. And then we're gonna create a service account that can be later on assigned to our application, and we're gonna call it KubeCon. I already have it deployed, I think. So I'm just gonna call apply to the right stuff. All right. And now we're gonna deploy the proper application. Let's look at it. So the only one difference from the previous YAML file is here you have the service account name, which is a KubeCon, and the same typo. <laughs> okay. Let's see now. So we are getting the pod. And we're gonna see the logs. Looking better now, cool. So now our application runs as a Kubernetes pod. And well, I'm done, thank you. Yes. Is this, uh, is that distinct from just running it as a pod? As no difference, it's just another definition and I usually like, okay, when I see a new definition, I think it's a new thing, but it's usually the same thing, just, you know, explained differently. So controller is something that just does this custom stuff outside of the Kubernetes. So what I, it can be deployed as a regular pod, it can be deployed as a uh, deployment, anything. I, see. I thought that, that um, writing a custom controller had something uh, you can do a bunch of stuff. Like you can you can extend the Kubernetes APIs, but what if you just monitor the Kubernetes resources similar to the way like I do? What if you just want to? Yeah. Any pod that's interacting with the API server, that's physically okay. Well, if it does some useful thing, you can call it a controller. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? So usually I use Alpine actually, <laughs> but this tool that I've shared earlier, the GoScale that actually creates the basic structure, it uses Ubuntu, I'm not sure why. Alpine is my favorite one because it's so tiny and just for this, you don't need Ubuntu. You don't need Ubuntu for this kind of functionality. Yeah. Is the controller uh, responsible for creating pod resources or creating some other resources? It can be anything, it can be monitoring the resource. It's basically bringing the resource from the dis from the actual state to the desired state. That's how they put it. And that's how like I explained it for the ingress controller. Like ingress, what is the desired state of the ingress? Just give me the access to the load balancer. And what is the actual state? Like when the user creates ingress, he just says, okay, so what I want to do, I want to balance between service A and service B. My desired state, I wanna get a load balancer IP address. And the ingress controller will actually populate this ingress with a IP address of the load balancer that it's gonna create somewhere. Oh yeah, of course. And yes, I'm using PowerPoint for my slides. <laughs> uh, okay. Here we go. Of course. No advantages, unless you, unless your permissions don't let you, you know, list the resources, which I run into, yeah. Uh, so you use the, uh, if I remember right, you use the uh, uh, list. Yeah. Right, to get a, get a list 
all the clouds. This is right. right. No. It's um, is there something that kind of goes the other way and just kind of watches for events coming? Yeah, that's a, that's actually the informer part. So basically, okay. the shared informer is meant to watch for the resource. Let me go back to the. Let me go back from this PowerPoint to oh, to ID. No, no, I'm happy to go to ID. I love ID better than PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, so this is it. So the, the, the list watch. The list watch is just an instruction for the informer on how to how to watch the resources. So here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to watch on the node changes, like all the nodes in my system. Please watch for their changes. Whenever the add or update happens, call these functions. And those are mine functions. Right, right. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that's when anything changes on the node. Yeah, when, the node when, the no when the node definition changes by some, uh, by some way. Right. So if you look at the cube, kubectl, oh, sorry, let me get bigger. If you do OJSON, it yeah. will give you like the entire object because kubectl doesn't display you everything. So you look at the the JSON output. And what do you see here? You actually see all the images. Right. Oh, there's so many, yeah. So it gives you the list of the images with their names and the respective sizes. So, and yeah, if, if, if node object gets changed, gets changed, it doesn't mean that the image gets changed, but we like, we are making our best effort here, so. And so theoretically, you could change that thing that, that Resource that it watches from API nodes like API pod. You can watch any. Re you can watch any resource. Um, there is a bit of a difference if you decide to watch the custom resource. It's not as easy, but it's doable. But if you want to watch just any core Kubernetes resource like pods, it's very sim it's a similar thing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, in, in case you know, or what's the difference between doing the informer watch mm -hmm. and I just, uh, it's, it, it, the, the, the advantages of that is basically, yeah, cache, you've, you've, you've said that cache is very important. And then it handles all the like failure cases, like what if, what if the connection to the API server is lost? Then it's gonna handle it for you. So you don't have to worry about it's like, oh, okay, if something wrong, just go this way. So the informer is gonna handle it for you. No more questions? All right, thank you everyone, yeah.